Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag edition of AMC Movie Talk, uh, coming to you here on our AMC Movie uh, News YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, for those of you who don't know, what we do on this show. This show is basically the all mailbag installment. And that means we want you guys to send us your email questions. And you can email us anytime, by the way, at our email address at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. So you can send your email to us anytime. And every day on AMC Movie Talk, Monday through Friday, we take a couple questions from the mailbag. And then on weekends, we take a whole bunch of questions from the mailbag. Since you guys send us like hundreds and thousands of emails, um, and we like to get caught up on those and just sit around and talk about movies. And I got a, a, a couple of issues, and now this this show is also a very, uh, a very laid back um, show, probably the most laid back show we do uh, here on AMC Movie News. And um, it, it gives us the opportunity to just kind of talk nonchalantly, uh, give you guys some behind the scenes stuff, j just talk very casually as film fans about the formality of doing the movie talk show. And I've got a, one or two things I'd like to bring up and talk about today, um, but it would all be predicated on this. Uh, yesterday, which was Friday, we had a really cool thing happen. Well, first of all, last week, as most of you know, we had the president of Marvel, Kevin Feige, the director of Guardians of the Galaxy, James Gunn, and the star of Guardians of the Galaxy, Chris Pratt, come into our AMC Movie News uh, studio and we talked Guardians of the Galaxy for like a half hour. It was a great event, had a really good time. Well, now, yesterday, uh, continuing on our Marvel trend, if you will, uh, the star of the new Captain America, the Winter Soldier, um, uh, Sebastian Stan, came into the studio and joined us there. There you can see him with uh, me and Chris Lee. And, of course, Sebastian plays the Winter Soldier. He came in and, and talked about the new movie, and we had just a great time with him. He was uh, very forthright and talked a lot about, you know, how he ended up getting the role of the Winter Soldier, how he uh, originally went out screen testing for the Captain America role, actually, which is really kind of funny when you think about it, because one of the things I said to Sebastian yesterday was, you know, Marvel seems to be making a habit out of screen testing guys for one role them not getting it, and then just handing them another role that they become iconic in. Like they did that with Tom Hiddleston. For those of you who don't know, and I know most of you do, but for those of you that you don't know, Tom Hiddleston, who played Loki in uh, Thor and in The Avengers and Thor 2, he actually auditioned for the role of Thor. He wanted to be Thor. And uh, he didn't get it, but they liked him so much, they just said, hey, why don't you play Loki? And, they, and he just got Loki. And the same kind of thing happened with Sebastian Stan. He actually went in and auditioned for Captain America, didn't get it, but they came back to him and said, we got this other character named Bucky Barnes that we'd like you to think about playing. And he became Bucky Barnes and, of course, the Winter Soldier. So we had a great time with him yesterday. Uh, we've got a few more cool surprises coming up in the next week or two uh, with guests, so keep your eyes open for that. But it, this brings up a really interesting situation. Now, a, a lot of people, and this comes up every once in a while, and, and I'll tell you right up front, the topic that I want to discuss here for a couple of minutes before we get to the mailbag questions is the topic of spoilers. Because um, when we started announcing, hey, you know, um, Sebastian Stan, aka Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, is coming in to, to do the show with us, a lot of people, or at least a number of people, accused us of sp giving spoilers saying you know i didn't read the comic book i didn't know bucky barnes becomes the winter soldier you just gave away a big major spoiler and no no we didn't we didn't give away a spoiler and i want so i want to talk for a second i thought because this comes up a lot about what is a spoiler really now i actually did uh an, a video on my old website called The Movie Blog back in 2008 that simply kind of addressed this. And I'll, I'll put a link to it in the uh, show notes in the description of the video there. So you'll be able to find a link to that original video. But I'm just going to repeat a lot of the stuff that I say in that video. Um, I think, you know, spoiler is a very subjective term. What is a spoiler to one person, one, what one person might consider to be a spoiler, another person might not. And so you get people who aren't giving spoilers get accused of giving spoilers because of a differing definition. I want to suggest this, okay? That we have a working definition of what a spoiler is. And in that video, I suggest this. I say a spoiler 
is any piece of information, audio, video, or image that if revealed to the audience member will affect how they view and experience the movie as intended by the director and the studio. So a spoiler by my definition is any piece of information, be it audio, video, or an image that if revealed to an audience member will change the way they experience a film as their experience was intended to be by the director or the studio, okay? And, and here's what I mean by that definition. I, I think there are certain things um, that can be considered spoilers and cer certain things can't. So let's say, for example, uh, a piece of information that could that would not be considered a spoiler. Like some people think if you reveal anything about a movie, that's spoilers. And, and this, quite frankly, that's not true, okay? Um, let's say I told you that in the new Captain America, the Winter Soldier movie, uh, Captain America has a fight against George St. Pierre, a.k.a. Georges Batroc, uh, or Batroc the Leaper, as he's known in the comic books. Well, see, while that is revealing a piece of information about the movie, I think a lot of you assumed, since George St. Pierre was in it, playing the villain known as Batroc, I think a lot of you assumed and know that he's going to have a fight with Captain America. And you knowing that piece of information is not going to alter your viewing experience as you're watching the film as the Russos, the director, or Kevin Feige, the, the produ production guy behind it, as the filmmakers intended. Knowing that George is going to have a fight with Chris Evans, a.k.a. Captain America, in this movie before you go on to see it, isn't going to change your viewing experience of the movie whatsoever, as intended by the directors and the producer. But now... Let's get into another piece of information. Let's say that, uh, you know, Anthony Mackie is in the film and he's playing Falcon. And, and what I'm about to say is not true, so don't freak out, okay? I'm just using this as an example. Let's say in Captain America 2, it's revealed that Anthony Mackie, the Falcon, is actually the Red Skull. And I tell you that. Well, now, that's a spoiler. Because knowing that, the Russos and Kevin Feige didn't want you to know that as you're watching the film so that when the reveal happens, it has a certain impact. So you see, if I told you that Anthony Mackie actually ends up being the Red Skull, that does affect your viewing experience as intended by the director and the producers of the film. And that can legitimately be called a spoiler. Okay, so now let's get in. Let's go to the next level. Then that whole part about as intended by the director and the producers is important, because uh, back in the day when Pirates of the Caribbean three was coming out, um, a, a piece of news got announced that um, uh, Rush, uh, I'm forgetting Rush's name, the guy who plays Barbosa. Uh, anyway, uh, Jeffrey Rush. Thank you. That Jeffrey Rush was returning for Pirates of the Caribbean three. Well, a lot of people thought that that piece of information spoiled the end of Car Pirates of the Caribbean 2. Because, you know, he makes a surprise appearance. We all thought Barbosa was dead. But here's the thing. Revealing that Barbosa is going to be in Pirates of the Caribbean 3 was not a spoiler. Why? Because the studio itself announced that Jeffrey Rush was coming back. They put out a couple of promotional images of Jeffrey Rush, um, you know, back in the Barbosa costume. They listed it on the Internet Movie Data page that playing Captain Barbosa, actor Jeffrey Rush. They So the studio itself and the filmmakers themselves were letting you know because in their heads that you knowing that Jeffrey Rush is returning for the next Pirates of the Caribbean is not going to affect your viewing experience as they intend. And that's key. That's important. Now, this brings us back up to uh, Captain America, the Winter Soldier. You know, we mentioned that, hey, on the show, we've got Sebastian Stan, Bucky Barnes, a.k.a. Bucky Barnes and the Winter Soldier. And a lot of people got uh, some people got kind of upset saying, I never read the comic, so I didn't know Winter Soldier was Bucky Barnes. That's cool that you didn't know that, but... There are promotional images out there that the studio has released to the public showing Winter Soldier with his mask off and it's Bucky. You can see him. They've put out on the Internet Movie Data page, he doesn't just play Winter Soldier, he's, he's Bucky Barnes slash the Winter Soldier. 
you know, when you go to the red carpet premiere and they, they're bringing out the, the cast, you know, and you're watching just the live stream and you're watching the red carpet, they announce him. Sebastian Stan, Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier. So you see, when the studio is promoting it and the filmmakers are putting out images of him as the Winter Soldier and they list it on the Internet Movie Data page as him playing the Winter Soldier, you can no longer make the argument that knowing that Sebastian Stan is the Winter Soldier is going to affect your viewing experience as intended by the director and the producers of the film. You can't make that argument. It's not a spoiler. Once studios and filmmakers decide to make a piece of information or a picture or whatever a part of the publicity and the marketing, that's not a spoiler anymore. Any more than you can say that, you know, Optimus Prime in the new Transformers film at some point is, a, is the classic flat-nosed Peterbilt truck that a lot of people always wanted Optimus Prime to be. You know, if I told you in the new Transformers movie for a time, Optimus Prime is the classic flat-nosed Peterbilt truck, you can't say to me, John, you just gave away a spoiler because it's in the trailer. It's in the trailer. The director and the filmmakers have decided to use that as a part of the marketing because they don't feel that, and, and they're the ones who know best about their own movie, that knowing that piece of information will, will alter or hinder or be negative towards yours and mine viewing experience of the film. So, yeah, certain pieces of information could be considered spoilers, but if the studio and the filmmakers themselves use them for promotional and publicity and are making it public knowledge, then it can no longer be considered a spoiler. Hence, us talking about how Sebastian Stan is Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, that's not a spoiler because that's public information now. They're using it as part of their marketing. So that's not a spoiler. Now, I'll also take it one step further. In the video and talking about spoilers, I, I say that there are pieces of information that can be legitimately considered a spoiler that at some point have to be considered fair game for public discussion and discourse. So, for example... Uh, and what, spoiler alert, Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. So Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. That, if, if I told you that the week of release of The Empire Strikes Back, that is a major spoiler. Clearly, no denying it. But at some point, whether you're talking about Citizen Kane and Rosebud is actually the sled, whether you're talking about the, the sixth sense and Bruce Willis was dead all along, at some point, legitimate spoilers have to become fair game for public discourse. And my kind of rule of thumb is this, is if a movie has already finished its theatrical run and then months and months and months and months pass and it comes out on home video, either on Netflix or streaming or you can rent it or whatever, and then months pass after that, like close to a year has passed since it's been available on home video, then, then you as a viewer have had plenty of time and plenty of opportunity to see that film. And at some point, you just got to say, well, you know, if you haven't seen that movie by now, then you're probably not interested in it and you're probably not going to see it. At some point, we have to be allowed to talk about the films openly and publicly. Not while it's still in theater, not when it just comes out on home video, but at some point after that, whether it's five months, six months, a year after that, at some point, even the most shocking of spoilers have to become public domain for open discourse and conversation. So once again, I would say a spoiler is any piece of information, audio, video, or image that if revealed to the audience member will affect their viewing experience as, as intended by the director or the filmmakers. If you understand that something that could be considered a spoiler isn't a spoiler if the studio starts using that information for promotion and publicity and makes it publicly aware and open public information, and if you accept that at some point, even the most shocking of spoilers have to be considered fair game for open discussion, then I think we'll all start to have a clearer, better understanding of what a spoiler is. We'll, we'd all have, you know, take better care not to step on each other's spoilers toes. And we'd, we'd be on the clear. But because so many people have so many definitions of what a spoiler is, um, you get people calling other people, you know, spoiler hogs, even though they didn't reveal a spoiler. So let's try to get on the same page when it comes to spoiler. Anyway, that was a really long opening topic talking about spoilers. But I, I think this is an important issue um, for film fans, and especially film fans who read movie news sites and watch shows like AMC Movie News and AMC uh, Mailbag. It's important for us to have a common working definition of what is a spoiler and what's not. And I contend to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, 
that t- saying Sebastian Stan is the Winter Soldier is not a spoiler by any sense of the definition. Anyway, that was the first topic, but this show is called Mailbag. So let's get into the mailbag topics today. And the first mailbag topic today comes to us from Elias Tofed, uh, who writes, Hey, MC, love the show and watch every day. My question is, what is your favorite remake? And a great graphic in their background there of Scarface, one of the best remakes of all time. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the uh, Al Pacino Scarface is actually a remake. It is. Uh, For me, I've got two I'll mention, and they kind of fit into different categories. First, for me, I would have to say I think the best remake is The Lord of the Rings. Because a lot of people forget there was an animated movie about it. Now, some people say, well, that doesn't count. It wasn't like a theatrical animated. And I would argue back that, but it was a film based on those books, and then they made a live-action film based on it. So by the literal definition, the Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings films are remakes. But if you really want to say that those don't count as remakes, and I contend they do, but if you want to contend that they don't count as remakes, okay, I've got a second film then that I count as my favorite remake of all time. And it's not Scarface, it's not The Fly, uh, it's not John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, it's actually... Uh, Martin Scorsese's The Departed. Uh, I've mentioned this film a lot on on AMC Movie Talk before, but The Departed, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture, won Martin Scorsese his Academy Award for Best Director. The Departed is based on the Asian film Infernal Affairs, which is my all-time favorite cop movie. And uh, Martin Scorsese took that film, remade it for the North American audience, uh, with Matt Damon and, and uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Wahlberg, Alec Baldwin, just a terrific cast. And I love that movie. I love The Departed. I, I still slightly prefer Infernal Affairs, but The Departed is masterful. Great film. Like I said, won the, the Academy Award Best Picture. That is my all time uh, personal, my all time favorite remake. All right, let's move on to the next question. The next question today comes to us from Jamail Van Dyke, who writes, Hello, John. With all these movies being redone, just talking about remakes, what do you think about rebooting the Rambo franchise in a present-day setting, being that the first movie was released over 30 years ago? I think they should cast The Rock as John Rambo. He would be a perfect fit. Well, Jamail, if you watch AMC Movie Talk... You know I love me some rock. I love Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I I mean, everything tastes better with a teaspoon of sugar and a tablespoon of the rock. I mean, I I love Dwayne Johnson. I I find him immensely entertaining. Is he one of the world's best thespians? No. But I find him ridiculously entertaining, and, and I love watching him on screen. But I don't know that really a Rambo remake would work. And if you did do one, I don't think Dwayne Johnson's the right guy for it. First of all, why don't I think a Rambo remake would work? Well, because Rambo Rambo really isn't. The first Rambo film, First Blood, is what the movie's called. A lot of people still think it's called Rambo, but it's not. The first Rambo film is called First Blood. That's the name of it. Rambo isn't in the title. It's called First Blood. It isn't really an action film, although there's plenty of action in it. Brian Dennehy's in that movie, too. My God, he's so good in that. Anyway, um... Rambo is a character movie. It's really a character study about this vet who has been unable to really figure out. I mean, a vet who's really been damaged by the war that he fought. And he fought, in, I believe he fought in Vietnam. And he comes home and he hasn't been able to reacclimate himself back into society and figure himself out. And it's, it's left him confused and it's left him wandering. It, it's really, it's it's an incredibly deep film. It, the first First Blood movie, the first Rambo film is so unlike all the other Rambo films. Um, because not all the other, you think of the Rambo franchise, you think of a super violent, awesome action hero thing. First Blood was a legit motion picture. I mean, it was a great, it was a character study and beautifully acted, beautifully directed. And... I just don't think, while post-traumatic stress syndrome is still absolutely a big problem with the men and women who serve um, all of our various countries, uh, definitely an issue. I think there was a a particular identity with those who served in Vietnam when we look at our history, because it was such a divisive um, war. I mean, you you had vets coming back. 
you know, e even people who didn't approve of the Iraq war, right? Um, whether they were conservative or liberal, Democrat, Republican, when the soldiers came back, I think there was a unified effort, effort to say, even if we disagreed with the war, we want to treat our warriors as heroes when they come home. But with the Vietnam thing, a lot of us who, and, and I, I'm too young to remember Vietnam, but, I, but, I was, but I'm old enough to remember the discussions about Vietnam were still going on when I was like 12, 13, 14 years old. And, you know, when the soldiers came back from Vietnam, that was a different story. A lot of them were treated as criminals coming back and had a hard time fitting in. And anyway, John J. Rambo in First Blood is a character who really epitomized all that in that struggle. And, you know, then he runs into a, a, a well-meaning sheriff in, in, in Brian Dennehy who just pushed the wrong buttons the wrong way, didn't know what to make of John J. And, and basically all this problem starts up. I don't know that you can capture that same... Um, sociological um, implications that the first First Blood did with, say, modern stuff. Not, once again, I, I'm i speaking from a, from a position of total ignorance. I, I, I've never served in the military. Closest I came to it was, was being in the cadets when I was a kid. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that like the issues of post-traumatic stress syndrome, all the, those are all very real, still exist today, big things. But the social stigma of, of soldiers coming home today isn't what isn't the same situation as the soldiers who came home from Vietnam. And, and in that ways, you know, America learned a great lesson from the mistakes they made with how they handled their returning soldiers from Vietnam, and they gotten a lot better. But let's move on from that. Let's say you did remake First Blood. Could Dwayne The Rock Johnson be the right guy for that? No, 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 no. I love The Rock, but no. Um, that That is a really different character. And I just don't think The Rock, I don't think you could accept the depth of John J. Rambo if it was portrayed by The Rock. And a lot of people forget Sylvester Stallone. We just think, a lot of times we just think of Stallone as the, hey, what you do? We think of him that way, but he's actually a really good actor when he, when he wants to be. He has been at least at certain points in his career. And I don't think that The Rock would be the right guy to play Rambo, unless you totally changed what Rambo was. If you totally change First Blood and just make it an actioneer, you know, one man against, you know, the backwards thinking local cops and, and community and... If you want to do that, then yes. But if you want to do a, like a true to the spirit of Rambo remake of First Blood, then I don't think, number one, that you can do it at all. But number two, if you did do it, I don't think The Rock is the right guy for that. Um, so anyway, that's just my thoughts. Uh, if, if you think differently, that's cool. That's that's the great thing about being film fans. We can all have different opinions and neither of us are more legit than the other. Anyway, okay, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Julius Sprouse who writes, hi oh, love the show. I, I, um, I read that there is talk of Space Jam 2 and could feature LeBron James replacing Michael Jordan. What are your thoughts on this? And could you clarify the rumors floating around? Well, we talked about this on Mailbag a little while ago. There was this report that came out that Space Jam 2 was happening and that instead of Michael Jordan this time around, who's obviously retired, uh, it was going to be LeBron James. And LeBron James will be the new star of, of, uh, of Space Jam. And that rumor was quickly shot down. Uh, ESPN quickly followed that report up by saying, hey, you know, we talked to LeBron James and his people and they deny it. They say this, this just isn't true. I mean, we, this, we've never even heard of this. So could it happen someday? Sure. But according to those reports, it ain't happening now and it's not true now. Um, and we mentioned that before. And, you know, I said when I talked about this before. And, and I, I admit, I admit, I'm about to get into a little bit of sports talk. So for, cause I, I, look, you just, you should know this about me. My first love, my first passion is film, but, but my second love, my second passion is sports always have been. I've done a lot of sports blogging in my life and, and things like that, but um, particularly uh, MMA. But anyway, I said at the time, the LeBron James, I mean, if you're going to do Space Jam 2, well, when they did the first Space Jam, they went out and got the undeniable best basketball player on the planet. And that was Michael Jordan. Probably best basketball player of all time. So if you're going to make a Space Jam today, then you get the best basketball player on the planet. And that's LeBron James. I know there are some LeBron James haters out there, but deal with it. He is the best basketball player on the planet. 
He just is. And I w- it made me giggle when some people try to no, they should get Kobe. Kobe, please. Kobe, nice. He's got one MVP. That's nice. Talk, talk to me when he's got four MVPs, like LeBron James does. It will be five MVPs pretty soon. Uh, when, when Kobe's got five or four MVPs on his mantle, then talk to me. Do you know, interesting fact, uh, that after the same amount of games in the NBA, so if you look at the amount of games LeBron James has played, I know I'm sports talk. Just bear with me for another minute, guys. I promise I'll wrap this up soon. For those of you who, who know nothing about sports or don't care about sports, just follow me just for a second. But if you take the total number of games that LeBron James has now played in his career, all right, and then go back and take Kobe's career up to the point that he Kobe had played that same amount of games. So for argument's sake, let's say it's 2,000 games. It's not 2,000 games. But for argument's sake, let's say Kobe, uh, LeBron James has played 2,000 games in the NBA. Then let's go back and look at Kobe. Well, where was Kobe when he played his 2,000th game in the NBA? And if you compare those, I kid you not, look this up. Look it up. LeBron James has more points than Kobe did at the same point in his career. More assists, more blocks, more steals, a higher shooting percentage, more three-pointers, a higher three-pointer percentage, uh, and I think I already said more blocks. So once again, comparing their same points in their career, LeBron James has more points, assists, rebounds, blocks, higher shooting percentage, more three-pointers, and a higher three-pointer percentage. Do you really want to try to have a debate that Kobe is even in LeBron James's league? Do you really want to have that debate? Because you can't point to anything that would suggest Kobe might be as good as LeBron. Now, some people like to say, you know, the most desperate argument that people like to say, people like to say, but Kobe has five rings. That, that's a team award. Guess who else has five rings? Guess who else has five rings? Derek Fisher. And a lot of you are going, who? Yeah. Derek Fisher has five rings because he was also on five NBA championship teams. Uh, the, the NBA title, the NBA championship ring is a team award. And LeBron James spent the first seven seasons of his career on the worst team in the NBA. Whereas Kobe Bryant had his, had his draft rights traded to Shaquille O'Neal and the Los Angeles Lakers. Kobe Bryant never won a single championship title without an all-star team around him. He just never did. Uh, he, uh, you know, he, you know, Shaquille won a bunch of titles and LeBron got to be, or uh, Kobe got to be on Shaquille's team as Sha- Shaquille was winning these NBA titles. And so Kobe got rings too. And then once Shaquille left, they didn't win anything until they re-surrounded Kobe with more all-stars. Uh, and then Kobe was able to win more rings again. Kobe, look, Kobe's a very, very, very good basketball player. Do not get me wrong at all. There is no denying he is... When, you know, when you, if you're going to put together the 50 best basketball players of all time, you're a fool. You're a fool if you don't put Kobe Bryant in that company and talk about him on that list. You're a fool. But there is no statistic you can point to that, that would suggest that Kobe comes anywhere near LeBron. That, just my opinion. But uh, if you want to argue with me, point me to some statistics. Because all the statistics go the way of LeBron James. Just, just saying. Anyway, let's go on to the next thing. And right now, there's so many people mad at me. Anyway, you can see how much I care. Uh, the next question today comes from Jameson Placken, who writes, So the other day, you talked about Batman versus Superman and a Marvel movie opening the same weekend in 2016. Uh, my question is, why does that matter? What's, what's wrong with two movies opening at the same time? I mean, don't people go to see more than one movie? There are, there are enough people who will see both movies and even maybe in the same weekend. Well, what Jameson is talking about is that um, Variety reported that Marvel is going to open Captain America 3 on May 6th, 2016, the same day that Batman vs. Superman is supposed to come out right now. So you got two giant superhero films lining up to open on the same days, pardon me, same day as each other. This is unheard of. And uh, we've been talking on AMC Movie Talk about this, that this is a high-stake game of chicken, and somebody's got to blink. So what Jameson is asking is, well, you know, what's the problem with opening? Don't people go to see more than one movie? 
Here's the thing. And I think those of us who are very active movie fans, we forget this. The vast majority of the people in America don't go to see more than five or six films a year. The, the majority of people in America don't go to see more than five or six films in a year. Um, now, for those of us who are big film fans, that seems ridiculous. Like, I'll go see five or six films in a week. But the majority of Americans don't go to see more than five or six films in a year. That they take time, hire a babysitter, go out and see, make a night out of it, go, go to the movies. And, you know, they don't do that more than five or six times a year, most people. So when you got two giant tentpole films that is designed to get those, not just the diehard movie fans, but also those fans who only go to see five or six films a year, they want to get them to their movie. And you open them on the same weekend. That, that causes problems. I guarantee you, and, and the industry knows this, I mean, there are going to be a lot of people who may have seen Batman vs. Superman and Captain America 3 this year that if they open at the same time, may only see one instead of two. May only go to see one of them and choose one instead of seeing both. Um, those people are there and the industry knows that. And, and that's why it's a big issue. Now, they're both still going to make money. Absolutely, they're both still going to make big money. But you're, you're also wanting to make as much money as you can because you got to fund all these other films your studios do. And that is their concern. And that's the worry. And that's why this is a game of chicken. Because I'm telling you, Captain America 3 isn't going to make nearly as much money as it would have made if it didn't open on the same weekend as Batman versus Superman and vice versa, Batman versus Superman isn't going to make nearly as much money on its opening weekend and during its theatrical run as it would have if it didn't open at the same time as Captain America. So this is going to hurt both of them. Marvel doesn't seem to care. Uh, DC cares. At some point, one of them's got to blink and one of them's got to move. I'm sure cooler heads will prevail. We got a long time between now and May 6, 2016. They'll make some. They'll come to some kind of compromise, and uh, and they'll get that worked out. All right, let's go on to question number five today. And question number five today comes to us from Carl Fleming, who writes, "Greetings from Christchurch, New Zealand. I saw Rango uh, back in 2011 and absolutely loved it. Uh, from Ham Hans Zimmer's score to the impressive animation, it was so much fun while also paying homage to classic westerns. Do you think it is likely we'll see a sequel anytime soon?" Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I wasn't a big fan of Rango, but you're not alone in your love for Rango. I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends and colleagues really, really like Rango. Um, for whatever reason, it didn't quite strike the same chord with me. I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't love it. Um, but that's just me. Like I said, a lot of my friends really, really enjoy that film, and I'm glad that you did. Uh, but from what I understand, there was some very early talk that... Rango was something that maybe the studio could franchise and continue on with. And if you watch the movie, you know, hey, there's some there's some directions they could go with this story and, and do a sequel and uh, keep the story going. They could, but as far as I know, they, they, it never actually came to fruition. They, no plans actually materialized. There were some discussions, but it never went any further than that. So uh, unfortunately for you and a lot of my friends who really, really enjoyed Rango and, and would love to see a sequel, I, it doesn't sound like there's going to be a sequel anytime soon. Um, and uh, so, no, I, I don't think we're going to. I don't think we're going to see a Rango sequel. If you've heard differently, by the way, if you're a viewer and you've heard differently, by all means, please leave your information, um, uh, what you've heard in the uh, chat board below, because that would be very informative. All right. The last question today comes to us from Michael Grippa, who writes, I've been hooked on your show for the past 10 months and have not missed a show. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. Here's my question. Do you think that Marvel will kill Steve Rogers and Captain America 2 or 3 and Bucky Barnes will take over the mantle of Captain America? Keep up the great work and bring on the filthy. Well, the, the reason Michael is asking this question and why a lot of people right now are asking this question about Bucky Barnes and, and could he, you know, might they kill off Captain America? Could Bucky Barnes become the new Captain America? The reason that that question is floating around a lot right now is because it got announced or it became public that... Um, Sebastian Stan, who we were talking about earlier, has a nine picture deal with Marvel. So he has a nine picture deal. So what a lot of people are doing now is they think a lot of people think they're putting two and two together and going, ah, well, Chris Evans only has three more films on his deal. Sebastian Stan has nine films on his deal. Therefore, what they must be planning on doing is killing 
uh, Steve Rogers off. Because that, remember, that happens in the comics at one point. Um, they're planning on killing Steve Rogers off. And they're signed Sebastian Stan to a nine film deal so they can make him the new Captain America. Bucky Barnes will be the new Captain America. There you go. I, I don't think that's happening. I don't think that that's, I, do, I don't think they're planning on killing off Chris Evans. I don't think they're planning on killing off, uh, the, you know, the, the Steve Rogers character. Um, and here, this brings up a thing that I've, I bring up and talk about all the time, but it always bears repeating. What people don't realize is that just because, like for instance, Chris Evans right now has three more films left on his deal. That doesn't mean Chris Evans will be back for Captain America 3. All it means is that if Marvel wants Chris Evans to play Captain America again in Captain America 3, then Chris Evans is obligated to appear. But it does not obligate Marvel to use Chris, uh, uh, Chris Evans if they don't want to. So even though, see, some people think that they hear that Chris Evans has three films left. That means Marvel has to use Chris Evans in three more films. No, it does not. What it means is if Marvel wants to use Chris Evans for three more films, then Chris Evans is contractually obligated to appear in those three films. But it does not obligate Marvel to continue to use Chris uh, Evans as Captain America if they don't want to. And why wouldn't they want to? I'm just saying that for an example. So when we hear that Sebastian Stan has signed a nine picture deal, remember that doesn't mean that Marvel plans on using him for nine movies. It, it doesn't mean they plan on using him for any more movies beyond Captain America, the winter soldier. All it means is that if Marvel wants to use them nine more times, then Sebastian Stan has to oblige them and show up and, and act in nine more movies. If Marvel wants him to. Maybe Marvel just wants him for one more movie. Maybe they want him for three more movies. Maybe they don't want him anymore at all. It doesn't matter to Marvel. Just because they have that nine picture deal with Sebastian Stan, that doesn't mean they have to use Stan. It simply means that if they do decide that they want to use Stan, that Stan has to appear. So understanding that, put on the brakes a little bit on trying to put two and five together to equal four. Okay? Put the brakes on saying, well... Since Chris only has three films left and Sebastian has nine films on his deal, that means he's going to become a Captain America. R remember, temper that by understanding that Marvel, look, Marvel went through a lot of crap with Robert Downey Jr. Because Robert Downey Jr.'s contract, they, he had fulfilled his contract with the amount of films he was supposed to do. Remember, they went through that whole big public battle it's for signing a new deal. And I believe now Robert Downey signed for two more films. Well, guess what? Marvel's learned their lesson. So now they're like, okay, you can now be in our new Marvel film, Actor X. But if you do, you got to sign this contract for seven films, for 12 films, for nine films. If, we, if we're going to put you in this movie, if we're going to put you in Doctor Strange, you have to sign a nine film deal or a 10 film deal or an eight film deal that requires you to keep coming back at X pay rate for those films, if we so choose to use you. And then it's up to the actor whether to sign that deal or not. Um, so by keeping that in mind, no. I, I don't think Sebastian's um, nine-film deal with Marvel means anything. I don't think it means anything at all. I don't think it means that he's going to be the new Captain America. I don't think it means he's going to be in you know Avengers 3. I don't think it means anything. All it means is that if Marvel decides to use him then he has to appear, but it doesn't mean that they've decided that they have to use him. So just keep that in mind. Anyway, folks, um, that'll do it for me on this Saturday, a lovely Saturday afternoon. Thanks a lot for joining me here on AMC Mailbag. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing in AMC theaters everywhere right now. Let me bring this up here. If you want to go see a movie, head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, Showtime, and movie ticket information. And don't forget, if you'd like an audio-only version of this episode, check, subscribe to our audio podcast on iTunes. And uh, you'll be able to listen to our audio-only podcast, and that'll be a lot of fun too. So, thanks a lot for joining us, guys. We'll be back again tomorrow for another installment of AMC Mailbag. Once again, very laid back, talking off the cuff, casual. We even got into a little basketball talk, which I'm sure 
bothered some of you. And I promise no more basketball talk on tomorrow's show. Uh, so thanks a lot for joining us, guys. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until next time, bye-bye.